Good morning, and I'd like to thank Patricia and Peter and Sages for the pleasure of uh, giving this talk today. These are my relevant disclosures. And I would like to today to review the results of not just the roller trial, which uh, we just presented uh, last year actually in this uh, auditorium, uh, but also the results of some of these other uh, studies that have been mentioned throughout the day that I think are very pertinent and uh, relevant to the entire field. And also compare the efficacy of robotic and laparoscopic resection based on what we know in uh, early 2016. Uh, as you know, there have been three major studies, randomized studies, comparing laparoscopic to open resection for rectal cancer. And these are the COLOR2 trial, the ACOS of Z6051, and the a la carte Australian trial, Australian and U New Zealand trial. And uh, despite this evidence, uh, I think the field is in a state of utter confusion, as you probably already know. Uh, the COLOR2 trial was the first one that was uh, published in uh, 2013 very large uh, trial in uh, 30 centers, eight countries, comparing in a two-to-one manner laparoscopic and open resection. This was an, a non-inferiority trial, and the end point, I think, was uh, uh, very clear, recurrence at three years. And I think this is important comparing it to the other two trials that we'll discuss in a minute. The short-term outcomes of the COLOR2 trials, I think, showed very convincingly the superiority of a laparoscopic approach compared to the open approach in terms of uh, operative time, return of bowel function, and uh, length of stay, with no adverse pathologic finding in terms of completeness of the mesorectum or circumferential resection margins. The conversion rate in this trial was 17%. Their survival data that was published uh, last year showed equivalent curves overall and stage for stage between the two modalities. So you would think that after this, the field is, uh, can rest and, and laparoscopic resection for rectal cancer should be an acceptable modality with some uh, important short-term superior outcomes. And unfortunately, that's not the case. As we heard, uh, these two trials um, had some very important and different findings. This is the uh, ACOSOC Z6051. Uh, it went on for many years comparing one-to-one -one, uh, over 200 laparoscopic patient uh, and 222 open patient. This was a non-inferiority trial, but the endpoint was not um, um, recurrence. It was a composite pathologic uh, endpoint made up of three parameters, negative distal margin, circumferential sexual margin greater than one millimeter, and complete or near complete mesorectal fascia. And these are the results in a nutshell. Uh, they had 82% successful resection in the laparoscopic group and 87% in the open group. And this did not support non-inferiority, so a double negative. Uh, the length of stay was equivalent, conversion was 11%, morbidity was the same, and there were um, two deaths in each group. Based on this conclusion, um, uh, based on these results, the conclusions are very draconian at least in the United States, that laparoscopic resection failed to meet the criteria of non-inferiority, and therefore, these findings do not support the use of laparoscopic resection for rectal cancer. So for, for, for I think, people who want to practice evidence-based medicine or surgery, I think that we can say that there is, in effect, a temporary moratorium on laparoscopic resection in, in this country. And uh, this was echoed. Um, verbatim, really, by the Australian and New Zealand trial, the a la carte, that was published in the same issue of uh, JAMA surgery. Again, non-inferior trial with the same composite pathologic endpoint, looking at uh, these uh, three pathologic parameters. And this trial, too, uh, almost mirror image, 82% successful resection in laparoscopic group and 89% in the open group, not supporting non-inferiority, no difference in length of stay, conversion around 9%, same morbidity and mortality, and really the same conclusion that uh, we cannot um, advocate for the use of laparoscopic surgery pending longer follow-up with recurrence and survival data. Now, we go on then to the roller trial that, uh, together with our colleagues in England, um, we uh, 
really envisioned in uh, 2007. It was finally funded in 2009 and started shortly thereafter. Um, and the funding generously came from the MRC in, uh, in the UK and uh, comparing robotic laparoscopic resection for rectal cancer. Um, the, the impetus for this early on was that we were impressed with the low conversion rate and low CRM positivity rate that we were getting with uh, the robotic resection. Uh, Meta-analysis have supported these early impressions showing that uh, at least in the available literature, conversion rate with the robot for TME seemed to be lower. But obviously, all of these early studies came from expert centers doing a lot of rectal surgery dedicated to robotic and the issue of bias was indeed something that we needed to, to come to terms with. Roller was uh, designed as a um, superiority trial and uh, we um, aimed to accrue 400 patients randomized one-to-one -one laparoscopy to robotic, uh, 200 in each arm with very simple follow-up at 30 days, six months, and three year for recurrence and survival. The primary endpoint was conversion to open surgery and we estimated the robot would be superior to laparoscopy and that would cut conversion rate by 50%. And with that, we would have an 80% uh, power to detect a statistically significant superiority in favor of robotic. And these were other, uh, other uh, secondary endpoints, uh, pathologic survival, functional, and uh, uh, quality of life and healthcare economics. In terms of the uh, patients, we actually accrued more than we had estimated. We ended up with 471 randomized, 234 to laparoscopic, and 237 to robotic. And the overwhelming majority of the patients had their allocated surgery. There were 40 uh, operators in 29 sites and 10 countries. Uh, and this is, I think, an important uh, um, uh, piece of information to share, that the number of operations done by surgeons participating in roller, and surgeon had to do both procedures. These were done, uh, all the operation, every surgeon was, uh, was um, supposed to participate in both types of operations. The median number of operations done was 91 laparoscopic and 50 robotic. So overall, I think these were highly experienced operators who had overcome, for all intents and purposes, I think, the learning curve, uh, for sure in laparoscopy, probably for, for robotic as well. In terms of uh, operative data, uh, robotic operations tended to be a little bit longer, 300 minutes versus 260. Operating room time was accordingly uh, longer. Lento stay was not different, and the use of uh, stomas was also not different. About 60% um, uh, of patients had temporary ostomy and 20% had permanent ostomies, and these were APRs, obviously. Now, in terms of the primary endpoint, the overall conversion rate was 10%. It was 12% in the laparoscopic group, 8% in the robotic group. It was lower, but not by 50%. Um, and so the odds ratio did not support statistical significance. However, in subgroup analysis, we found that in male patients, and 65% of patients were male gender, the conversion rate was just about 50% lower in the robotic arm than in the laparoscopic arm, 16 versus 8.7%. And this did achieve statistical significance. Uh, there was also a trend toward reduced conversion rate in low anterior resection compared to high anterior resection and in obese patients. CRM positivity rates were very low, 5.7% overall. There was 6% in the lab group and 5% in the robotic group, obviously not statistically different. In terms of complications, these are intraoperative complications. Uh, really identical, about 15% in each. And you can see the, all the different types of um, adverse events that we try to capture intraoperative. Equipment failure, for example, that's something that uh, with, with robotic, uh, we, we at least initially worried about was no difference in laparoscopic or robotic arm. Mortality, 
the same. There were two deaths in each uh, group. And the 30-day complications were also no difference. The anastomotic leak rate was about 10%, and it's included in the GI complication group. So in summary, what can we say about this, uh, all this data that has come out really in the last uh, uh, couple of years? In terms of roller, I think we can say that this is some of the best data I've reported in a randomized rectal cancer trial. We had excellent pathology with low CRM positivity rates and very high quality of the mesorectum and very low conversion rates. I think it's important to stress that surgeons were quite experienced in both the laparoscopic and the robotic approach. And I think the study supports something that at least I have felt personally and been saying for a long time, that these techniques are additive and complementary. They're not antagonistic. Surgeons who set out to do one thing and only one thing and not embrace all the modalities that we have available, including the transanal approach, which I think fits very well in this paradigm, I think are, are doomed to be isolated and limited in the spectrum of the disease that they can treat. In terms of the results of roller, statistics aside, p-values and odds ratio aside, I think that roller shows an important reduction in conversion rate in the most difficult cases in favor of robotic surgery. Male patients, low tumors, and obese. If we had had 60 more patients, this would have been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and, uh, and the issue is whether do we need to do that to prove it or do we believe the eyeball test moving forward. So in conclusion, I think we're actually living a pretty good era. I think all recent studies show that minimally invasive surgery for rectal cancer is safe and feasible in experienced hands. No machine will do these procedures for you, no matter how expensive and sophisticated they are. I think there are some clear benefits of robotic rectal resection compared to lap in rectal cancer, even in surgeons who were highly experienced in doing laparoscopic TME. And my personal suggestion is that maybe we don't need more studies, but more training, especially in the United States. Thank you.